I'm Terry Sharp, and I'm a retired wildlife biologist. Now I help landowners with land management, doing some forestry work and still some wildlife work in the south central Piedmont and Sand Hills of North Carolina. And I've been on Sand Hills game land off and on for the last 40 years, and that's where I was first introduced to prescribed burning. Working in longleaf pine ecosystem with my emphasis through my career has been on the ground cover species, the bobwhite quail and the, the birds and critters that, uh, that live not in the tree canopy so much, but on the ground and looking for ways to uh, make room for them to live in the pine forest. I guess if you had to sum it up in one sentence, it would be thin and burn. So you're looking for ways to get light to the ground and disturbance to the ground so that you've got a, a healthy stand of grasses and wildflowers there that provide cover and food for a whole suite of animals. Recently, we've started working with private landowners more. We've, uh, a lot of the public agencies are doing a good job of managing their forests now. And, but these are isolated blocks, and so we're trying to work with landowners that, to connect up these blocks of habitat. So when you're working with private landowners, um, they can have a number of different objectives, but uh, usually there's an income objective which might involve harvesting uh, timber or might involve raking pine straw. And, but most of these landowners are interested in more than just making money from their land. They live there, so they want a, a nice place to live. And they may be hunters or enjoy watching wildlife. They want a, a pretty place to live as well as a place to, to make money or supplement their, their income. When you first go to visit a landowner and look at their property, a lot of the people that we're working with have properties that have not been burned in a long time. So we have to kind of think about burning in a some different ways so you're of duff on the ground and you may have to burn several times in the winter time under damp conditions in order to eat down through these layers of leaves and pine straw that is collected over a long period of time before you can really go in and uh, and start doing more maintenance type burns which you do when the ground cover has been uh, established. So if we start with a landowner that has, has not burned, but he has a longleaf pine forest that he would like to burn, you know, the first thing we do, we go out there and we look to see what kind of fuel levels are there, what kind of fire lines are in place. We look to see what's going on around him. Uh, is there a, a road or a church or to determine what conditions he needs what wind directions he needs uh, in order to burn. Once you've made that decision, you're gonna burn and uh, the time of year is right, which usually these first burns would be winter burns, start putting in some fire lines. And a fire line is just a, a strip of land. It can be a road, sometimes it can be a creek, and oftentimes it's um, just an area that you've raked the fuel away from. If you've got grasses there, you may need to cut some grasses. And once you establish your fire lines, you want to think about getting them put in in such a way that they can be there in the future because it's not a one-time thing. Landowners do it a lot of different ways. Some people use a leaf blower and a weed eater. Some people have farm equipment. They use a tractor and a disc or a landscape rake. So lots of different ways that fire lines can be put in and can be maintained and it just depends on your particular resources. One of the things that the Prescribed Burn Association is doing is um, providing some assistance to landowners by having experienced burners go out and visit their property before they get ready to burn to kind of help them through uh, look for potential problems like a dead snag close to a fire line that we can take care of before we burn. Try to assess how much help we're going to need. Look at what resources they have. Try to help them gather those resources and use them effectively. 
and to pick the right times to do the burning. One other thing that the Prescribed Burn Association does is it helps landowners become certified burners. And the certified burner process, um, there's some legal benefits, but there are also some very practical benefits because it gives you more or less a checklist of things you need to do before you burn and to prepare for the burn so that it can be done safely and uh, efficiently. You're getting ready to burn. You need to get a uh, burn permit, which you can get from the North Carolina Forest Service. You can go online and get them now. It's pretty easy. The morning of the burn or the day of the burn, you go out, you check your fire lines. Um, you want to call the, um, the 911 number for your area to uh, let them know that you're planning to do a prescribed burn. You'll also call them when you finish up your prescribed burn. You get your resources together. One last call to the neighbors, get your burn crew together. Most burns are conducted using the, the same principles. No matter whether you're burning an acre or 100 acres, you always start on the downwind side. Uh, you light a test fire first and make sure it behaves as you expect. You light a backing fire and you allow that to increase your safety zone on the downwind side of the side of the fire. Once you've got your back and fire in place and you've got a safe distance to any flammable materials on the downwind side, oftentimes you can can start using some other techniques, some spot fires, which are burn a little faster than back and fires but are not too hot. Or if it's real damp conditions, you might use some strip head fires that will uh, burn a little hotter than the spots and move faster, but, um, but oftentimes if it's dry conditions, they build up more heat than you want and can scorch trees. Typically, if you've got a, a typical landowner that has a forest that has not been burned in a long time, you'll want to go through with several cool season fires or winter fires or fires shortly after a rain to eat down through the duff layer. And it may take two or three or it may take four or five of these fires to uh, to get down to mineral soil. Once you get down to mineral soil and you start seeing your grasses and your wildflowers coming back and the duff around the, the trees has um, been eaten through, then you can get a little more aggressive and start burning during the lightning season. Many of the plants and animals in the sand hills respond better to fires that are burned during the summer months or the warm season and um, they may flower better, they may um, provide better cover for wildlife, but, um, but you have to get your area in shape before you start using these lightning season fires. So you not only want to look at weather on the day of your burn, you want to think about what kind of weather you've had in the weeks leading up to the burn. Have you had some rains so that the fuels will have some moisture in the lower levels and won't uh, smolder for days after the fire. And you also want to look at the weather forecast for the next few days after you burn. Uh, do you have any big fronts coming through that uh, may have some high winds? Or is there a rain predicted in the next few days? It's often nice to burn when you know you have a rain predicted in the next couple of days so that if you do have any smolder that the rains will put it out. Once you start burning, you know, you may want to burn annually for a few years as you eat down through the duff, or you may want to skip one or two years instead of waiting three or four years for duff to build back up. Oftentimes you can set up for summer burns by doing a winter burn and then allowing one growing season worth of fuel to collect out there before you start in with summer burns. One of the big potential benefits of this prescribed burn association is that that a landowner doesn't have to go out and make a lot of decisions on their own. They can have some help from people who have had experience in burning to uh, kind of lead them through and, and help them make decisions about burning for the first few burns in particular until they get some personal experience and uh, learn about their particular property and what's going to work best there. From a wildlife perspective, you need to be thinking about what's on the ground, not so much. You know, we're often uh, look at the trees and see the forest, but we, but we don't look closely enough to see what's going on on the ground. 
and the things that wildlife need is cover and a variety of different plants on the ground. So you're looking for grasses is kind of your indicator species and grasses are so important to this whole process because they're an important fuel component and they're important from a wildlife standpoint because they provide cover for most of the species that we're interested in. So the more different kinds of plants that you have out there means more different kinds of seed. It means more different niches and hiding places for wildlife. It means more different kinds of insects. That's kind of the bottom of the food chain for a lot of, uh, a lot of species. Plant diversity is really important. So the prescribed burn association is going to help you get started with burning. It's going to also connect you with a lot of other people that are doing the same kind of things that you are. will allow you to, to network with them. And what we're finding is that people learn about a lot of other things besides burning, uh, forest management and seeing how their neighbors are managing their forest and we all learn from each other. So there may be some cases that a project is just too complex for a landowner to take on on their own. And um, there are some other resources out there. The North Carolina Forest Service does some burning on a contract basis. And there are also a number of uh, prescribed burners that do contract burning. And you know, if you have a, a big tract that's just more than than you want to handle. In particular, on the first few burns, if you can call in some of these other resources, it may be, may be worth doing. And uh, I would encourage you to get out there with them while they're doing the work so that, um, that you get more experience because just the more time you spend on the fire line, the more you learn about fire behavior and the better you're gonna be at uh, getting the results that you, that you really need out there. It's not something that you're going to go out there the first time and 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 have it down and you can't read about it. You need to be out there and see what happens under different weather conditions. So uh, so getting out on a lot of burns is uh, is going to be really beneficial and it's, it's a lot of fun.